Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 187 for Monday, October 29th, 2018. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? Good, man. It was a, it was a, it was a weekend, as they oh, say. Oh, dude. I, I, yeah, it wasn't, the, the week never ended for me, but <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was What'd crazy. I, well, I, you know, I realized I, my, uh, my October is a lot like your, like July and August. So, uh, I wound up this weekend. I had four, well, yeah, four gigs. I had Brechtones Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I had, uh, a fling gig also on Saturday and then last night, after our final Brechtones uh, performance, I had a rehearsal for Madhouse that's happening uh, on Halloween, which is Wednesday. So, yeah, so it was interesting. You know, Brechtones, this was our final weekend, and it went really well. You know, this show, I talked about it last week, but, you know, the 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 changes of the poets every night really kind of kept us all on our toes. And then Saturday night, we had a sub. And when I found out about this at the beginning of the run... Uh, our main guitar player uh, had to go to a wedding or something, you know, I mean, it was unavoidable and he knew about it before the run started, but um, you know, it's like, Oh man, we're going to get this thing locked in and we're going to really like this, this show it's 90 minutes, but it just flows. Right. And so there's a lot that just sort of happens and it's like, Oh man, how's this guy going to like, how are we going to drop this guy in? And, uh, and he, it was a guy named Nick Fanuff who played in a band called the tan vampires. And I think he plays in a band called the soggy poor boys uh, now, but he, uh, great name. Yeah, I know <laughs> he like, he prepped himself. He came in, he knew all the tunes. He knew kind of understood the flow of the show. He and I took like 90 seconds to walk through, uh, you know, the flow of things and how, what we needed to sync up on. And he was like, yep, yep, no problem. Um, but, uh, but it, you know, it, uh, it, it's all worked out. He was great. Big ears. He really listened. And, you know, it was interesting. We had got, we had gotten the show to a point where it was dialed in and a little bit, uh, maybe too much on autopilot. And, Especially with our poet jams, like, you know, they would come up and say a thing and we all sort of knew how each other was going to play. And when Nick, you know, Nick, had, we hadn't done any of these with him because they hadn't happened yet. And when the first one happened, you know, we picked a key, we picked a groove or whatever based on whatever the poet wanted. And Nick started playing and he started going through a chord progression, which was like, oh, we had always basically just stayed on the one, you know, to keep things simple. But it's yeah. like, OK, well, if uh, if we're if that's what we're going to do, that's what we're going to do. And and so everybody followed and everybody listened and that worked out. And then uh, later in the night, you know, they picked the key of G. And so he started playing. He started playing this progression. I was like, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> is that what I think it is? And sure enough, our sax player picked up on it and started playing the melody. And suddenly we were in Creep from Radiohead. Which was perfect. This person wanted, you know, they said, uh, I want like resentment. And like, OK, so we played resentment in G, which became creep, which uh, which was great. It was just sort of a, you know, happy little surprise. So big ears. And and that was which was good, you know. So cool. Yeah. 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 So well, got, so, uh, so that went well. It, it was yeah. it was interesting, though, because that night I also had a fling gig. So Brechtown started at eight. And then a fling gig that we we actually had a fling fest scheduled for that night. And I, I kind of had to juggle some things. So our fling fest was six to nine and which worked out well for us. We played first and we played acoustic. Um, and we, so we played six to seven and then I raced to the theater and, uh, and, and was there thankfully in time, you know, to actually, we even got a little sound check in, which we didn't expect to get, but, um, but it was good. And fling fest was fantastic. It, it was, it, we had, 
like the biggest storm we've had in a long time. I think we got an inch and a half of rain in 24 hours here. And, uh, and then of course it was game three of the world mm-hmm. series, which mattered here this year because the, the Red Sox were in it, of course. And you know what? It worked out. Um, the timing of our show was great because people came out early and then went wherever they were going to go for the, for the socks. And, uh, and and we had a pretty full house and the band sounded great. Oh, it's so it was That's cool. acoustic, you know, acoustic is so much easier, man, like from a sound standpoint, because we really didn't get a sound check and that's a weird room to do sound in. So you really have to dial it in. And it was just, you know, it's much lower volume. And so, you you know, you don't have drums bouncing around and, um, and basically everything goes through the PA, which, you know, gives you one place to manage it for gives them one place to manage it from. And it worked out. It worked out really well. It was, it was a nice, That's cool. a nice set of music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long did you play? Fling played an hour. We played an hour. Okay. We had a couple, uh, we had a, uh, Russ's son, uh, Ian played some acoustic tunes. I missed all of the rest of this. Of course, I literally walked off stage to my car and left, but, um, and then we had uh, another kid who does, uh, he's a, like a rapper. He's actually really good. So we had the two of them. And then we had a band called the church ladies close out the <laughs> evening for us. And they're fantastic. They, and they always play in costume oh, anyway. Them at the previous show. Yeah. Yeah. We've done, we've done another gig with them and they, they're, they were What's great. What's their repertoire? It's originals, all original music, and uh, but it's like dancey kind of poppy stuff, synthy a little bit. It's guitar, bass, drums, maybe two guitars. Yeah, two guitars, bass, drums, keyboard, and then the guitar player. One of the guitar players is the lead male singer, and then there are I think three female singers, at least two. So yeah, they've got a lot of people on stage, and and they know how to put on a show, and and they're they they're great. Dress like a church lady. They do. Yeah, the lead singer they does do. for sure. Yeah, yeah, the lead singer dresses like a church lady for sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, it's great. It's great. You yeah. know, if we talked about um, the spasmatics. Yes, we've mentioned them before. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're yeah. kind of a franchise model. You know that. Yeah. That, uh, there are many spasmatics around the country that are. I, I don't. Even, I don't know how they're coordinated. With literally, someone has the copyrights to all this stuff, right? And he sells, you know, sells the guy a kit, or whether he starts local bands in different areas and puts these things together. But there, there's some interesting business model to be learned there. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, so, so Fling wanna... Fest went well. I wish I could have. Uh, I wish I could have been there for it. <laughs> but, yeah. But you know, it's. It, I'm glad it all worked out the way that it did. So it, that's a lot of playing, though. It was. And I'll talk a little bit about the rehearsal that I had on Sunday in a minute, but I think you've got some stories to tell too. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Chomping at the bit here. So no, it's okay. We, uh, my weekend was interesting. I had a, I had a winery happy hour gig on Friday night that I wasn't expecting terribly much from, but it turned into this really, really nice thing that there was a lot of people there. I knew a lot of people there and, um, you know, the stars generally, you can tell if the stars are lining up if people request things that you already play, right? If right. they don't know. Right. <laughs> right? That's you a know, great. It's going to be oh, a good yeah. night. It's like, oh, let me see if we can do that yeah, one. Me, yeah. I, I think I can pull that one out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but it was a really, really nice night and it just set up for a really great weekend. But then Saturday night was a very big Halloween gig that I'd set up. Sure. And it is something I've been selling tickets, advanced tickets online for, for a long time, for two months. Yep. And we hit our goal for advanced tickets online. Uh, and then my thinking was that this, it's at a, it was at a club. This club has, you know, a pretty good built in regular crowd. Um, I would incent people to buy in advance, but I knew that there were a lot of people who were never going to see my promotions or the club's promotions. We put posters up in the club and, you know, the concept of buying in advance to go to this club was probably didn't click with a lot of people. So I knew I wouldn't want to sell the whole thing out in advance. Right. Make sense. Right. Yes, for sure. Yep. All right. So I was pretty excited for it. The whole band dressed up, but everybody really took it seriously. They look great. Um, you know, we, and actually side note, this is the club where our band got our start. So it's, it's the oh, place nice. where we had our first gig years and years and years ago, nice. kind of small. It wasn't a great club for us because most of the time our horns, even acoustically would be, you know, too loud over the top. Yeah. Right. Over the top. But, um, new owner for this club in the last year, a uh, very, very nice guy. Um, he's a different type of owner, as far as I can tell, you know, all my interactions with him, he's been very congenial, but the way that he conducts his business is very different from the previous guy. And I'll get into that in a second, but, uh, you know, 
one thing that this guy wanted to do was he wanted to open early. So typically, the, sh- the I think the place might have opened at eight or eight thirty, maybe not nine. And band would bands would play nine thirty to one thirty, and that would be the night. He wanted to open the doors at seven. And one of the first things when we discussed doing this, and he's the reason we ended up playing this is he's seen my band a few times, and we knew of each other. And when he took over this club, and he's been a real successful club owner in downtown San Jose for years and years and years, very experienced, um, and has his own style of doing things. He likes our band, and he kind of gets that in our town. This club is actually in the town that I live. Um, you know, we're a pretty good draw. So we got together for lunch and we were like, we should do something. And I had the idea, well, how about something special? Instead of just another club date, how about if we do a Halloween thing? Yeah. And then we got into, you know, however, you know, we charge a little bit more than what you typically pay your bands. Um, so he liked the idea. And because he liked the idea, I said, well, would you be open to this one? If we sell the tickets, I'll take all the risk. We sell the tickets, uh, but we get to keep the revenue. And he was open for that. Okay. So he yeah, gets to sell so, drinks to all these people that you bring into the room or that come into the yes, room. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. So I, I, um, I want, I, I'm going to put an asterisk here because I want to circle back to this. We, there, there is a, an art and an intention to managing what I'll call an existing relationship with a new club owner. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, they, well, that's they, really and, where this whole conversation wraps around. Well, to, we you know? dealt, we, d- we've, Without realizing, I mean, I realized it, but without thinking about it, we've been dealing with this for an entire year uh, with the Stone Church. The Stone Church ownership changed last uh, last fall and and the the new people that bought it uh, inherited our fling fest relationship. Mm -hmm. But there there was no institutional knowledge transfer about four months before it was sold. The woman that we had sort of you know, built this with left. She went off to nursing school or whatever, and she was great for the club. In fact, I think the reason the old owners sold was because she left and they were like, wait a minute, we don't want to have to replace her. (laughs) You know, like that, that happens. And so these new people bought it and these happen to be, it happens to be a couple that we've known for years. Our kids are about the same age. They were in jazz band together and all that stuff. So it was just like, Oh cool. You know about fling fest. This is great. We never really had that conversation. Like you just talked about where you sit down and you're like, we have a relationship with your club, but not with you about your club. You know, you, you know, know you can you know, often tell within the first 10 minutes of a conversation with a new owner, whether they've got so much on their mind that they just want to maintain status quo and keep good relationships. Yes. Or if you're if you've waited too long and they've been bombarded by 500 people who think now it's a new owner, a new a chance yeah. for someone new to get into this club. That can be a dynamic that's happening as well. Um, or if they come in, they're like, nope, I'm the owner now and I'm going to do things my way. Gonna, so, yeah. You know, yeah. So there's a couple of different scenarios that that you should you should have the ability to sense out which of those three doors. I don't know. You think there's any more than those three doors? Well, I, I think there's I think it doesn't matter with those three doors. And and this is, you know, years of sales uh, experience coming to play. Right. We've been running a sales business for 20 plus years and we have learned something because this happens. Right. Where it's like. You know, your company has been buying ads from us, but you are the new point person on this. You were just hired. Ninety nine percent of the time, the person that walks in that's, you know, newly in charge of this thing doesn't like to inherit old relationships and keep them the same. Right. They always want to feel like they have their mark on it. And even if they say they want to have they just, oh, yeah, yeah, we're too busy. Keep it the same. It's like I know that within six months you're going to punt this. Because it's not yours. You have no ownership over it. It's not a thing you created. There's going to be something that goes a little bit sideways because there's always things that go a little bit weird. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just how life goes. And you're going to say, oh, you know what? That's not even my thing. Get rid of it. And with that, we have learned. And, and it's funny. We learned this because it took us a year to do it with the Stone Church. We literally did it Saturday night. And these people bought it in October last year. Uh is we, you know, we sit down and say, hey, here's your existing ad campaign on the, you know, on the business side. Here's your existing ad campaign or here's our existing relationship with your club. And he, let me show you what we've been doing. But I want to hear what your ideas are. Yeah. And a lot of times the end of that conversation is them essentially in the sales business is them creating basically the same campaign that they had before we ever sat down. But now they feel it like it's theirs. Not so I wouldn't something. say it doesn't matter. What I would say is go in 
armed with the knowledge that it's probably one of those three doors you're going to work mm. for, work, walk through. Yes. And that approach of, you know, saying, let's make I it new hear, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Let's make it new anyway. So again, you, again, often what I've noticed in the couple of clubs that I've seen turnover, like I said, the owners either overwhelmed, you know, doesn't know who's going to bartend on Friday night. And, you know, you might be able to make his life easy by, you know, just explaining to him, we have these ongoing gigs and, you know, we're here and, you know, I just want to introduce myself to you. Yeah. Uh, you know, w- you know, I, I look forward to making this relationship continue. Um, or, you know, if you get that vibe already that this person bought a club because he has his own idea about what music should be, you know, sense that out. Right. Yep. Or, you know, something in the middle, possibly. So anyway, and, let me and I, will, I will say I, 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 I'm going to let you finish, but I, I will say don't I'm make the mistake. <laughs> right. That's See good. What you did there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, don't make the mistake that we did with fling with with the Stone Church, uh, because we almost lost this relationship. It was it was just you waited. Well, because we assumed we know these people oh, like they know cool. us well. Yeah. Right. They've been to fling fest before they bought the place like the, the, it, Of course, this will just be automatic. And of course, they're busy when they take over the place. And there was a, some scheduling snafus last year that, that we sort of had to sort out and. We found out earlier this week that they were not entirely happy with the way the the past fling fest or two had gone. And we if, if they did not come to us and tell us this. We just sort of found out and it was like, oh, crap. Like, right. We duh. We never had this conversation with them. And it, what we do is remarkably different from any other night in their club. Like we need to have this conversation. And thankfully, they sort of realized this at the same time. And we came to them and we're like, hey, let, can we talk? And they like, can we talk? And it, and it's great now, you know, like, but it, it took that conversation. And of course it needed that conversation. And of course the knowledge from the previous person didn't get passed through because she had left four months before. Right. You know, all right. of this stuff, but it was too easy for us to keep it on autopilot when we should not have. So just bear that in mind, you know, Yep. With anybody listening, when when ownership changes at a club, be proactive, be friendly, yeah. be all of those things. Get be, in there because other people are waiting for that opening. Get in there and listen to what they want. And we did. We made some changes to the way future Fling Fest will work based on some things that these new owners want slash need to do. And it's like, OK, cool. Like, cool. this is your place. Yeah. Good. So anyway. All right. Yeah, yes. Onward. Sorry. So. <laughs> Um, we were excited for the gig. Great pre-sales, hit our goal in pre-sales, had a good sense in town that uh, there was a lot of people talking about, but there were a lot of things going on in our town that night. So you know, it was still to be seen, but still felt pretty good about it. Um, we, again, it's going to be a long night. One of the first things he wanted to do was he wanted to open at seven. So if people want to come in, they can, they can have uh, drinks. And, you know, so I had to say, well, listen, seven to one thirty, we're not playing six and a half hours. So, you know, your bands, when they play nine 30 to one 30, they play about three and a quarter to three and a half hours. And we will do that three sets over the evening. And I sent him a note that, you know, they actually, everything we discussed, I sent him a note by text that, you know, said, here's where we are. He's not a guy who pays a lot of attention to text. And so we'll, we'll make a little note of that. Sure. Right. Yep, so, you got to learn. Yeah, exactly. You got to learn. Yep. So we get there. Um, Bill loads in, you know, he actually had extended the size of the stage from when we had played there last nice. for us, actually, for this night. Yeah, it was nice. And again, he's, you know, he's trying to make a, a good relationship. Sure. Um, and, you know, he saw we, we kept in close touch over the time that we were selling tickets. And, you know, we, we he actually took 20 printed tickets in addition to what I was selling online. He sold all of those. So um, we were in we were in good shape. Everybody's feeling really good. But, you know, how time tends to accelerate as you get towards doors opening, right? Like the, <laughs> so stuff, the stuff you want to do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we got three hours, plenty of time. Suddenly it's like five minutes to go and things aren't working. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, uh, let me just throw out there. I, my middle daughter often works the door for me. She, you know, she enjoys yeah. doing it. She's great at it. She, um, you know, she enjoys going to clubs in San Francisco where she lives and, and, uh, and she's, she, she gets it right. And she's done it at Charlie's the other uh, oh, yeah. place we play. Yep. For years, and she's done a great job. I mean, she's she's really so she's, she's calm, seasoned. Yeah. she's firm. She's you know she's heard you know you know it, it, 
uh, Paul said it's ladies night, you know, like, like everything that people might say as they approach, you know, to try and avoid paying to get in. Right. Um, so she's, she's great at it. Uh, we do sound check at six with doors opening at seven, a couple of glitches. And we're now we're getting down to, it's about six forty five when we're done with sound check. Um, Jill was set up and ready to go. Everything except for getting the owner's guest list. Right. So okay. she has my guest list. She has a couple of special things, you know, a couple of people who I promised tickets to that were going to pay me later. You know, a couple of things she's been trained. You know, she has the check in app. We use a service called Ticket Leap and uh, she has the check in app, you know, scanning existing tickets is a total one second thing. Um, looking people up if they say they forgot to, you know, and, and checking them in is a one second thing. So it's a really, you know, effective service and, and I'm very happy with it. Cool. So. Seven o'clock, pretty good rush. Pretty good rush of walk-up sales. Whoa, that's awesome. It is dawning on me at this point in time that um, we need to make a couple of decisions as to how many walk-up sales we're going to go. Because, you know, the people who bought an advanced ticket should be guaranteed a ticket, I, a, a place. In, I would in agree club. with that. Yes, I sure. I would agree with that as well. Yeah. Um, so I had said, check, owner, we need, we need your list and we need to come up with a number. We came up with a number. We blew through that number pretty quickly. And uh, then the band goes to play its first set. It, so remember, first set is 8.30 to 9.30. Earlier than that club is typically open. And we had a, we had a good crowd. I mean, it was, the club was quite dense at this time. Mm. Uh, but I knew that, you know, p- even people who bought tickets that know this club know what time the music usually starts there. Um, and so I'm, I'm guessing it's going to get a little bit more intense. The band played its first set not in costume because it was just too long a night. Understood. You didn't and have then, time. Got it. Got it. So we took an hour. We played 8.30, 9.30. And then I said, we're going to take an hour break. And then the guys went and got in costume. And, you know, and then, then we played two more sets over the course of the evening. Two more long sets. Oh, that's a long night. And yeah, yeah. It was a long freaking night. Anyway, Sp- we break I, I, and we go aside- in. If you're in a band and, and you know, it's t- probably too late for this year, uh, given the timing of this episode, but think about your costume and how long you're going to need to sweat in that thing. Because yeah. the year that I dressed up as Animal from the Muppets, a great <laughs> costume idea for a drummer, except for the playing part, you know, yeah. it gets Got really pictures? hot in a mask. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's pictures. I'll, I'll find one. Yeah. 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 Please. Yep. So um, there you go. So. I go and my wife is helping me um, get into my costume. She did like this awesome makeup job. I was a, I was a zombie, Um, but she lets me know um, the owner has cut off people coming into the club, whether they have advanced tickets or not. So right there. And then this is, this is about, there's a couple lessons in here. One, if you're going to run your own events, your ability to be available to solve problems in your own events, you have to be very, very realistic about, I was at this point in time, not really available to solve the problems. Right. Because I was sitting in a chair and getting my, my costume on. There are people in line. Um, my wife comes in to help me. She's like, well, you know, we got, we got a situation out there. Um, you know, and people are getting, getting a little bit ticked off. And, and it was both kinds of people. It's the people who had tickets who are rightfully ticked off and the people who walked up that were enjoying saying, uh, hearing no. Um, the owner happened to pop in while, while I was getting into my costume and my wife was putting makeup on me. And I was like, we talked about this. We picked a number and he's like, well, they should have shown up earlier if they wanted to be a guaranteed again. And I was like, we never told them that in the ticket, you know, there's nothing there. And it, it was a, it was an approaching heated conversation um, that didn't get, that didn't go over the top heated. You know, right. he was clearly stressed about his capacity and that if a, sure. a fire marshal walked in, he's going to have a really big problem on his hands. Sure. I'm stressed that I made a promise to people and it wasn't and and, and went to the steps to try and get it agreed to, you know, how many adva- how many additional tickets are we going to sell? And the reason we have to pick that number, the conversation was had was um, was, you know, to make sure that the people who bought advanced tickets got in. So yeah. that broke at that time that broke. I made, I think I made enough of a point that it seems like the people came in. And when I, when I went after I got my costume, when I went and checked in with my daughter at the door, she said, yeah, people were getting, you know, kind of heated about it, but, um, you know, everybody's cool. Nobody asked for their money back. You know, a couple of people took off, you know, but most people hung a little bit grumbly and it, and it was a manageable thing. 
Okay, here's the deal. Over the course of the night, the number of people who showed up at the door that said, I'm a friend of the clubs, I'm a friend of the bartenders, I'm a friend of the waitress, they told me I didn't have to pay, they told me there'd be a, the number of people who did that was really high. Oh. Higher than I've ever seen. Like I said, we play lots of clubs and, and we have worked the door at many of the clubs we play and it's never been like that. Um, and in addition, maybe because it's Halloween, maybe because it's a full moon, the number of people who would just simply not take no for an answer and just push past and just walked into the club. What? Now there was, there was one security guy, but he was doing double duty. He was kind of like scanning the floor and also peeking in on, on my door, on my daughter. Um, and he, when he was there with my daughter, she said he was great. And he was really helpful. He just wasn't there all the time. So the number of people who were kind of pushing in and just, not cool. And the number of people that were, that were actually abusive, you know, to her, like not cool. And again, she's done this and she can handle it. And she's, but she said, yeah, people are really not liking the answer. No, tonight, the club is full. We can't let anyone else in. The number of people said, well, so-and-so promised me I'm going in anyway, who just literally were, wow. were entitled jerks was just too high. And so the reason I bring all this up is that, you know, there's a couple lessons in here. You know, there's, there's the lesson of, when I did the ticketed event a couple of weeks ago, remember I hired an event manager to take care of all things. Mm. I thought this was a club date. You know, that was at a winery. This was a club date. And, and again, we've done a lot of club dates and this whole team is, you know, my daughter's worked the door before my wife was there checking on her, you know, and is a great go between, you know, she would go up and help. So the lessons are, are a few here. One is just doing an event. Like you just did your event, right? Yep. Um, Having escalation processes discussed and agreed to on your team is an important thing. Yeah, um, yeah, but it, it it's interesting, right? Because you can't always predict every scenario. But if you can't, then you have to have someone who can handle it. And if you're on that's stage, true. You, you, you need so, so that's you need kind to of delegate to someone. Yes, I see what you're saying. Right. Yes. So, totally so that that that's a thing. Yeah, and it can't be the door person because they got to be at the door. Right. Yes. And a couple of times my daughter actually went into the club and found people who just walked by and said, hey, you have to pay. I mean, that's how that's how badass she is. I was going to say that she's good at her down. job. That's great. Oh, absolutely. She takes it very seriously. And, you know, she's diligent and she doesn't want to let me down. And she also has a sense of right and wrong. that if mm -hmm. somebody is disrespectful, she's not going to let him get away with it. So so she actually went in and, and, and as did my wife on occasion, go in. Now, here's a side lesson. Knowing what I know now, I won't put my daughter or my wife in that position again, the clientele of this club, you know, the, the, the owner said was far too many. And I w would be naive to think that those people don't do that every freaking week and often get their way. Yeah. So, right. So yeah. People, the process, people generally don't do that unless they've been trained to do that. That's yeah. It. And I think, and actually that's it. You know, like I said, this bar owner is a experienced bar owner. I think he does that a lot. I yeah. think he says, just give him my name in general, or he gives out a business card that he signed on the back or, or something like that. And doing a, a, the band takes the door model in this club as it, as it was revealed to me was a challenging follow through. Yeah. Right. There, I don't believe there was any ill will. There were certainly the weird things that happen once you get a crowd of people. So there were a couple of times where the owner just waved some people in. Yeah. He never gave a complete guest list. Right. So that was another thing. So another note, you know, get everything in writing, what you agree, how many guests are going to be there. But the problem is, you know, even for me to enforce it would have been a challenging thing because I was on stage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, we dealt you know, with something everything's like that. Great when everything's great. We dealt with something like that. I don't know. Four or five years ago, we played some club and it was a bar downstairs, restaurant upstairs. And mm -hmm. we were getting the door, you know, and it was fine. And like we had sorted all that stuff out. And then I realized there were like, you know, three tables of people that we knew didn't pay. Yeah. And I, I went up to the person who was managing the door. I'm like, hey, you know, what's the story? They're like, well, you get to talk to the owner. I'm like, oh, I'm fine. I'll go talk to the owner. No problem. So I did. And he's like, oh, well, you know, they just came like they just ate in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, they spent a bunch That's of money upstairs. And so, right. And so they, they, you know, I, I can't ask them to pay again. And I said, oh, okay. Like, that's cool. I, I get that. They just spent a lot of money with you and you want to, you know, do something nice for them or whatever. That's cool. I said, but so you're going to pay their <laughs> cover, right? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, this is how we get paid tonight. And you just filled up three tables with people that yep. 
should have paid to get in. And I get that. How'd that go? You don't want them to pay, but I want you to pay. And I think he split it with me. Um, yeah. on that, but it was, which, he was which is a concession by you, right? It is, it is like, yeah, a, but he, now I've got a choice here. I can make a, a point of this, you know, 60, 80, 70, 90, a hundred dollars, whatever it is yep. and really create a problem. Yep. I can, I can, I can demonstrate to this guy, look, right is right. Agreement is agreement. That is another path that you can take through this conversation. Yeah. And that's actually where I come to as kind of the conclusion of my story. And actually my daughter is the one who shared this with me. He's, she was like at the end of the night, she goes, I'll, I'll give you two sides of this. One is, yes, far too many people, you know, came up and played that card that he didn't let us know that was going to happen. Right. He didn't always handle that right. He waved several people in. He never gave us a guest list. So there's a bunch of things that's wrong. On the other side, a lot of the people who came that once they were told they had to pay, they did play. He actually made you a lot of money. He brought a lot of people of his club regulars oh, in. Oh, that's interesting. And so you have to make that decision. You know, again, my daughter is wise beyond her years. That's She's like, really, you know, yeah. you have to make that decision as to whether you want to like push the principle of this or if you want to just say, okay, listen, the band had a good night. You know, financially, we had an excellent night. Yes, it could have been a little better. But yes, you know, yeah. it's not all black and white. There's no, shades of gray not. understanding of this. So. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Cause he, so, and, and the thing you want to manage, never- you want to manage your relationship with him, right? The club owner, new manager, yeah. whatever it is, but it, you need to bear in mind that he also needs to manage the relationship with all the people that come to his club on the nights that you aren't playing. Right. And so and he was often really good about it. You know, right, he, was, he, he actually, right. when asked several times, he was like, no, they have to pay. And several did pay. So, this is why, you know, yeah, it's and and I think that the lesson in this is be cautious of of trying to put it into a black and white, you know, fair, not fair. Yeah. Those people are getting my service for free now, that type of thing. That's where my first reaction was. And also, you know, the ones who are literally, you know, Chuck said I'm in for free. And then we're abusive and disrespectful. Well, that's not cool. You're never disrespectful to anybody. Right? That's different. Yeah, that's that. So yes, that's the thing. That's there was a lot of that. And she, you know, she's again, she's she's I would say she's as good as anybody could ever be doing this job. One, um, my wife happened to be standing there and one couple of women were incredibly disrespectful to my wife. And uh, Jill said, you're not getting in. And she went and got the bouncer and said, please escort these people out. So that's, you know, she's that's badass. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. No, she's incredible. <laughs> that's awesome. So, um, so a lot of moving pieces on this, right? So, so a, my sense was, I don't want to put my wife and or my daughter. I don't like who, who takes the door at Fling Fest? That, that someone from the club does. And okay. most of the time that works out extremely well. Like they, right. they take their job seriously. It, we have had nights where they've been short staffed or something and the wrong person is put at the door and things get a little, you know, loose. It, it yep. We tend to make fling fests. We, we usually are do them not for profit and, and all the you know proceeds go Which to some costs. charity or something. We, we do. The costs are costs are covered uh, out of that. And then so. It's not like we have to pay band members and that sort of thing. Oh, I see. Uh, y- you know, so. Well, we had a club once but where. It's still, the like the money should go to charity. Up. Yeah. Yeah. We had, we had a, a club where on a couple occasions, it was clear that the take wasn't right. And so when I brought it up with the owner, he was like, you know what? I can't accuse anybody of anything, but if you want to make sure it's right, you do the door. Yes. Right? That is the and right. So, that's the answer. And most clubs will give you that answer. Like, oh, no, we're. We're happy to walk away from this. I mean, usually they have to have someone there anyway, checking IDs. If it, if it's an alcohol related event, which, you know, most band yep. gigs are, but, and they're usually happy to let that person then also, you know, just take your, your money at the door. But most clubs that I've encountered are like, Oh yeah, if you want to have somebody, if you're getting the door, they're, they're actually happier to, to sort of, you yeah, know, get walk out, away of, from out getting, of the process. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, the, of the many lessons there, you know, an event manager is a good thing. A great door person is a good thing. I actually putting my wife and daughter in that position where they took that abuse from people who didn't know and is just not something I want to do. I mean, sure. you know, uh, and so it, it's not 
It's, it's, it's just not the right thing. I mean, they, they have my back and they want to do right by me and by the band, you know, the brand of is course. like family to them. And so, you know, they're sitting there, but, um, yeah. So again, part of it was Halloween. Everybody's a badass when they're in costume and it was a full moon and it was a hot party and everybody wanted in. Yeah. So there was a lot of things lining up. I had a little bit of a loose cannon, um, business partner on this who had to manage, his relationships and maybe didn't think through the net net of this. And, and the, the, if you would ask me that right after I finished the gig, everybody was pretty worked up and like this, you know, Sure, of course. if you ask me the next morning, once we kind of, you know, settle down and just think, you know, was he was just not responsible with his guest list and his commitments. Right. Uh, he was largely responsible, but not completely responsible. So that, that actually might be able to be managed in a, in a productive conversation. Uh, probably I, could. Yeah, my guess Cause he's is a really your, good guy. Your what you next can't manage gig with him is, is going to be fine. Yeah. What you can't manage though, is, um, is the clientele so used to getting what they want when they want that it's a challenge. I mean, I mean you can just, I guess maybe, put a bigger security guy there all the time who, when the door person, whether it's my daughter or anybody else says no, as soon as they start getting it, you know, you have a security guy. Well, yeah, You can't manage that for one off events or even once a month events. Right. It, it, the club can manage that or not manage it as they see fit in a general sense for the club. And it yeah. sounds like you ran into exactly that. Like they had managed it to a level that they're comfortable with. And right. that, didn't work given your relationship, you know, your business relationship for this particular gig. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So well, a lot of lessons in there. I mean, I'm, it, you I'm know, glad you made money. Was, That's good. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was actually the best club date financially we've ever done. Well, there you go. Yeah. Right. So, so that part's so, good. Everybody got paid. Yeah. That's good. Long, long night. Yeah. A lot of stress, you know, within that. It wasn't just, you know, a play thing. And and actually the stress permeates because like mm -hmm. I said, bands like family and they would see my wife and daughter upset and they would be defensive of, of them. And that, you know, and also, you know, it was just, it, it, Steve said there was a, my bass player, he had, a, he had a, let me look this up. He said that there was a vibe in the club that was, what's the word he used? What's the word he used? He is an astute uh, cat, for path, sure. Yes, a real pathological vibe there. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So that's awesome. And you know, people are crazy on Halloween. I yeah. mean, that's part of the thing. That's it so, is part you know, of the thing. Is, yeah. This is the deal between just taking the stage and this is the other side of the coin. Whereas we've had the conversation about how it's great to be creative in your in your gigs. Managing events is a thing. It's not just taking the door. It's, it's, you know, managing to expectations and it's being able to manage in the grays of, of things. Well, you know, you people. hear, you hear the stories about, you know, how Led, Led, Led Zeppelin's manager, but this is true of pretty much every band that toured up until like the mid eighties would, you know, leave the venue with satchels full of cash, right? Mm. Like that's how they got paid and they would bring it back to the hotel room and, you know, divvy it all up and, and squirrel it away or do whatever they had to do with it. Like, it, you, you know, you hear those stories and you're like, wow, that's crazy. It's like, no. Like this is the business side of this. There's, yeah. yeah, it's just how it works. Cash business. It's yeah. a cash business, you know, and and things get weird. And and you hear the stories about how, you know, some band got robbed for this or that and the other thing. And it's like, well, yeah, it's it's not this black and white thing. It is. It's a late night business. It's an alcohol related business. Yeah. It's you, you know, there's there's a lot of debauchery. That that exists in this scene, more or less, given, you know, your band and, and the places you play and all of that. But it is there is a lot of stuff that just sort of happens behind the scenes that, you know, isn't necessarily pretty. And right. uh, and it's not true of every club, but but it it's true of of most places in some at some degree. You know, it's it's not easy to make money as a club owner. Right. That's I mean, that's the reality. It's a very difficult business to to make successful. Some people are very good at it. Most people are not. And and, and actually, that's where my recollection of this new club owner style. He is he's been successful. He's been doing it for a long time. His style is clearly that he is the host with the most and his arm is around everybody. And, yep. you know, he walks around, you know, buying drinks for people and, and you know, his his approach. And he's a really nice guy. He's not a seedy guy. Right. That's good. His yeah. approach is to is to be everybody's best friend. And I didn't know the extent of that 
because yeah. literally some people lost their mind when they walk up to the front, you know, to, to get in and they're told they can't. And they say, but I'm a friend. And, you know, well, you're not on the list. And like, what do you mean? I'm always on the list. And so I, I'd have to do a lot of thinking about all the all the ways I would kind of isolate that problem to solve it. It's not just a well, conversation. And, and you, I don't think you're going to isolate it and solve it. Right. At this particular place with that particular manager, I think at some level you're going to need to accept some some slush on on that particular line. You know, it's not going to be a hard and firm thing. I I, Maybe. But but I don't think so. Based on what you're telling me, you're just going to have to swallow some level of that. Well, that's what I'm saying. That slush thing is really interesting because at the end of the day, you have to avoid I, I tend to. My, my, my fairness meter goes off. You know, A, if you're rude to my family, my fairness meter is off and we have a problem. B, if, uh, you know, why is that person next to you had to pay for my service, but why do you think you get it for free? Right. Right. So that's the black and white of me. Right. There sure. is, there no, is a, ju- a justice. I'm with you on that, man. I, I suffer yeah. the same, the same, uh, <laughs> you know, genetic flaw that the yeah. justice must be served and we all yeah. must be righteous. It, it, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think it's probably why we get along. <laughs> Absolutely. Right is right. Right is right. So last but, go, go ahead. I was going to, but uh, what you do with right is right is really what, it, it, and there's a little bit of a maturity thing, you yes. know, the ability to kind of like, Take in all the factors and not just right is right. You know, you got to pick and choose your battles in life as to when you're going right. to apply that strategy. But, um, you know, a lot of a lot of good lessons. Good, good. gig. You know, band played great. We uh, oh, I did want to say we added four Halloween songs. I do. I just wanted to share. I, I posted a video of Dead Man's Party, which was one of my very favorite songs. So fun to play. Yeah. Really hard. Like a crazy. Super hard to play crazy roadmap for that song, yep. like crazy roadmap for that song. Yep. Nothing is in force, right? Every, there's a couple threes, there's a couple yeah. twos, not, no, not, not time, just like phrasing. No, phrasing. You know, Fra- the phrases yeah. are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are all over the place. Yep. But a uh, great too. horn chart. Yeah. And uh, it was really fun. We played, I don't know if you saw this on the house rockers page, but um, we played enter Sandman. I saw that. And added horns to that. It nice. was freaking awesome uh and then uh two easy ones we did uh werewolves of london and um bad things from the true blood soundtrack you know the title yeah. song of the true blood show so yeah, yeah. those were our four contributions to halloween music nice. and it was a lot of fun that's yeah, awesome. really good <laughs> so last week we talked about drum sound right we answered that question from john about you, you know and we, and we wound up talking a lot about how instruments sound different in different rooms and and you have to think about that and approach them differently and i thought about all of you folks yesterday <laughs> uh because i had my drums set up at the players ring for the Black, for the Brecktone show which is i think i mentioned it's a small room uh brick walls low ceilings but lots of wood and just the 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 vibe of that place, like the acoustic vibe t- turns out to be fantastic. Like to the point where we don't even have to do any EQ on the mains to not get things to feedback with the vocal mics. I mean, it's just crazy the way this room is. It's awesome, right? It's almost like playing outside, except it's really warm and uh, like warm sounding. It's, it's got a nice round tone. And I, obviously got very used to how my drums sounded on that stage in that room, uh, you know, for the last three weekends. And so we finished our show on Sunday. We played a three o'clock show. We finished about five o'clock, maybe a little before it was a one act thing. And, uh, you know, we said our, our goodbyes to the, the crowd that was there. And then I packed up my stuff. And by six o'clock I was rolling out of there driving, all of about, I don't know, 300 yards uh, <laughs> down to the play, the uh, the Seacoast Repertory Theater where we do Madhouse and taking my drums back out of my car and loading them into the theater. So, it you know, it, I had to completely pack up, of course, and then, you know, unpack and, and set up my drums. So I did that and it was great. It was fine. I kind of took that, you know, you have that post gig glow when you, you, you know, you're still sort of processing the gig and you, you know, you kind of amped up from the gig. And I was able to, and usually I take that and like, uh, if I pack up right away, I don't even remember packing up. It's like the stuff just magically found its way to my car. That's great. 
And I sort of was able to carry that through to getting my drums set up in the new theater. So I was like, okay, cool. Like I, I didn't really think about this and here's all my crap. That's great. Well, uh, then I sat down and I hit my drums and I was shocked because I had been playing these so much, right? You know, especially even just in the last three days, you know, it was like every day I was playing them in this room and I know how they sounded and I know how to hit them and which sticks to use in that room and which brushes to use in that room and all that. And I hit, I grabbed the same sticks that I was using at the player's ring, which were lighter sticks with a very round bead on them to get a, a more focused attack because the, the tone of the drums just really sang in that room. So I, I didn't need to worry too much about that uh, with the stick choice. And, um, and I hit my drums and they sounded like boingy and bouncy and empty. It's a much bigger room. It, it, it's not as acoustically desirable over there at, at the rep. And I was like, oh yeah, right. This is exactly what I, what we just talked about. And, and so I was like, okay, change the sticks with a fatter bead on them to get a little more tone out of the drums. Got to use different brushes for the tune uh, or, th or three in, in Madhouse that I think I'm going to use brushes on or whatever we're doing, like Love Cats by The Cure and, and a couple others. And it's like, oh, nope, I need the heavier brushes, the thicker brushes so that they, they sound, you know, they, they draw out more sound. It turned out that the snare drum I used in the in the ring was the the right snare drum to also use it at, uh, at the rep, but it it really required just completely changing my approach. I even retuned a couple of my toms to get them to to sing right in that room. But it was really interesting, you know, especially after having that conversation last week. And you know, it was probably it was less than two hours between when I you know last hit my drums in the in in one theater and then hit them in this other one. And it was just so jarring, like. I knew what it was going to sound like because I had been doing it so much and I hit it and it was like, doesn't sound anything like I was expecting. Uh, so it's just interesting, you know, and it, it, it proves all the points that we talked about last week that you really can't take a sound, take an approach that works in one place, be it a club, your rehearsal room, your bedroom, whatever. And this is true of any instrument. It's not just drums. I mean, we all play instruments that are acoustic in the end they make sound and with a guitar player that's a combination of your you know your not just your guitar but your pedals and your amp and the eq there and and everything else and so it really kind of brought all those points home it was like oh yeah yeah gotta oh yep 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 okay gotta put these sticks away change yep okay yeah all right now we're good and by the end of it it was like uh, you know everything's comfortable and it's all good and the drums are you know sounding good in the room but it took a little while so it was, it was just interesting. I, was, I thought about everybody here. So it's nice. Well, I would add to that. We did this. Um, sound checks are hard for us because we've got a lot of guys and every room is a little bit different. And, sure. You know, even if you start with, you know, like on our, our, our presets, you know, on our persona sport, yeah. but you, you really need, you really need to give yourself time to get things right, especially when you go into a, a new venue or when the, the variables are different. Absolutely. I, I would say most people underestimate the amount of time because, you know, you, you want to be there as little as you possibly right. can usually, right? You right. want to get in, you want to play and you want to go, you know, so the thought of two or three hours before a gig is, is usually not met well, but you, you really do want to do it right. It takes time to get the sound right. You know, it's yep. a, yeah. E even if you know the room, I mean, that can cut down a lot because you've already sort of identified some problems or whatever, but you still have to address them. I mean, even with digital boards where you can say, okay, take the EQ uh, as it was at the end of the last gig here and recall it. Like that's a great starting point, but the speakers are going to be in slightly different places. The mics are going to be yeah. in slightly different. You know, you're going to you can't just assume that it's OK. Yep, we, we recalled it. Let's go. No. And then know. also like where you were at the end and the density of the room. That's that's a big thing. It's like the number of bodies in a room. That's a, that's a huge thing with with uh, sound checks. Often yes. is that the intensity and volume you play during sound check and what you need when there's one, two, three, four, five hundred loud people, you know, filling a room. It's a very different thing. Yeah. Yeah. Not only right. Not only do bodies absorb sound, but as it turns out, bodies also create sound uh, right. with their, with the top part of them mostly. And, and that's uh, it, that really changes. I, it, you know, I play some clubs, the stone church is a great example of this where the stage sounds great until there's people out in the house yep. talking and then it's awful on stage. You can't hear a damn thing. It's awful. Well, I do got to give a shout out. Bill outdid himself for this one. So not only did awesome. he put in the time, got there nice and early, got set up, you know, got the room tuned for him. Um, 
like I said, it's not that big a room. If you look at some of the videos, like if you if you go watch that dead man's party, you can hear how that's that's an audience video. I mean, you can actually hear that's the great. vocals are up above comfortably on everything. You know, a, a guitar playing a single note line as opposed to power chords is, is you know, cutting through really nice. The horns sound nice and in balance. And so it, he really did a good job, but it's because he put the time in. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't just happen automatically. So, yeah. Cool. Fun stuff. I always love doing this. I learned things. Crazy weekend, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Crazy weekend for both of us. It's I'm kind of coming up. What's that? Um, I have got- Madhouse on on Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, and then I think I've got next weekend entirely off from gigging. Ooh. Yeah, which will be nice. I mean, I've been, you know, I played. I mean, I played a lot in October, right? Because I did that. Uh, we did a fling gig, and then immediately it was into rehearsals and tech week, and then performances for if then. And immediately into tech week and rehearsals and performances for, for Brecktones. So I had two weeks, you know, I had that, whatever it was, that 16, 17 day period where I played every day somewhere else, not just here at home, but you know, I was committed. Do you have any corporate um, Christmas gigs with uh, Uptown Jubilee? With Uptown Celebration? No, Uh, Uptown's bookings, uh, you know, Gary with his restaurant business and all of that, they're pretty dry. I think we've got one, maybe two coming up. Mm. But, um, which is fine that like, that's the, and, and that actually might not have anything to do with this restaurant thing. Like we wouldn't, that band wouldn't play every weekend all year long. Um, uh, that's just not the, the, the desire or the intention of that band. So, uh, Got yeah, 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 yeah. So a couple of acoustic gigs coming up and I got a trip to LA I got to do. And so, yeah, yeah, man. Good so, stuff, man. Fun stuff. Yep. All right. Yeah. Well, I guess that's what we got. Right. All That's good? enough, man. We we were always performing quite a bit over the last couple of days. Always, always, always. It's a good thing to always be performing, my friend. I've heard that. Talk to us about your always performing at uh, in our Facebook group, giggappodcast.com slash Facebook. We'll see you over there. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Paul. See you, Dave.